Okay, uh, well, uh, welcome to yet another talk on concurrency, file in people, and uh, let's get started. Thank you for coming. Uh, so we continue with more concurrency and more uh, log-free uh, talks. So we're going to talk about basically why do we write log-free programs? Well, of course, I mean, that's obvious because they're faster. Well, uh, what do you do when they're not faster? That's uh, the real question, and we're going to analyze the costs of data sharing, data synchronization with some examples. Now, I prepared this slide before this morning, unfortunately. If I did it after, I would have learned from Dan's talk. Uh, who was here at Dan's talk? Yeah, so the more data I'm going to show you, basically the less you're likely to believe me. Dan have demonstrated that with scientific proof. So I'm going to kind of skim over the data and bloviate more. Uh, and then at the end, I hope to f actually give you some guidelines for when log-free is faster. Now, it's, uh, the focus of the talk is obviously about writing efficient concurrent programs. C++ is used as examples. It's not particularly specific to the language. Uh, it's very practical. I'm going to skim over some of the more kind of theoretical or more you know, pedantic details. I'll try and I, I'm not going to like tell you any lies. I may conceal some of the details of the truth uh, and you can ask me questions and I'll tell you more that I know. It's not a class on log-free programming, but that's okay. Those of you who understand more, who know more details, will have some ed educated guesses about some of the things I'm telling you. Those of you who don't know anything, it's enough for you to know that log-free programming exists. Oh, I, I just told you that log-free programming exists, right? Uh, to understand sort of where, what I'm driving at. And then how to actually do it, well, uh, you can look at my last year's talk, you can actually come to me and ask questions, I'll be happy to tell you more about how to do it. Uh, in general, writing, writing log-free programs is hard. It's harder if you want them to work correctly. Uh, now, in practice, the reason you start on this path is because you want better performance. Since we're going to talk about performance like all the time, what's the rule number one of performance? Never guess about performance, always measure it. There is also rule number two of performance. Uh, well, uh, that, yeah, there is uh, rule number one. Your measurements must be relevant. That's the one that gets you after you learn rule number one. And we'll see some, I'll talk more about that. Okay, so here is your real life practical decision diagram for going uh, with log-free programming. Do you want faster program? Yes, uh, you try to put it log-free, it doesn't work if you, uh, you slap a couple locks around it and then it works. Now this actually, as depressing as it is, it makes some optimistic assumptions about software engineering process. Specifically two assumptions. One, that you actually profiled before you decided that's performance critical, and two, that you actually tested to know that it's correct. If you didn't do one of those things, you, you, you don't know uh, that it's actually working. Okay, so from the beginning, what determines the performance of the concurrent programs? Well, that's, I promised you a practical talk, and that's not a practical question. The practical question is, I wrote a, a log-free program and it doesn't scale, what do I do now? That's the practical question, so we're going to go that way. Now, several things. There is a high-level and low-level parts to it. High-level parallelism, basically how much work can be done in parallel. That's your algorithm, data, uh, partitioning, these kinds of things. And if you have single-threaded parts, how long they are, that's Amdahl's law. Low-level parallelism, what individual units of work can I do in parallel? Uh, how much data sharing can I sustain? And so on. And uh, that's the focus of uh, like talks on low-level concurrency primitives such as log-3. Now, there is some overlap. The more different things, the smaller things you can do in parallel, the more different algorithms suddenly become parallelizable. So it's not entirely independent. 
A brief note on the benchmark. So there is a reference to Google benchmarks. I used it for some of my benchmarks. I, I wrote some of my own uh, just to verify that the results make sense. The way I'm presenting results is it's for the fixed amount of work. So if uh, I have on one thread some amount of work, we'll call it one. If it scales perfectly on two threads, I'll get the answer, uh, it's done in half the time. That's just how I, how I report the results. So if it's perfectly scaling, uh, the time will drop down uh, as divided by number of threads. If it doesn't scale at all, if it's perfectly serial, this line will be flat, which means two threads did have the work each, but one after the other. And if two threads did have the work each and it took them longer than one thread, then I got some overhead on top of that. That's just so you all know how to interpret these results. So you could have fixed amount of work per thread, for example, then it would look different. This is how I do it. Okay, uh, several types of concurrent programs that you might have encountered. There are wait-free programs, which uh, each thread will complete its task in finite number of steps. Now, steps aren't exactly the same as time. Nonetheless, all the threads are making some progress toward final results. Log-free programs where at least one thread is making progress at any time, and in log-based programs, it, it's not guaranteed that anything is making any progress. Wait-free or log-free doesn't mean that it's not sharing any data. It just means that it does it in a way that doesn't require logs. <clears throat> okay, so how much does it cost you to share data? Sharing data is like the bane of concurrence. If you didn't have to share data, you would have perfectly parallel, what's called embarrassingly parallel programs. Life would be great. Let's take a very simple example. We're, we have an atomic integer, and we're going to increment it on all of our threads at once. It's a weight-free program. Each thread is going to do however many steps, which uh, increment is a step. However many increments I wanted to do, that's how many steps. Okay. Uh, the Blue line is sharing. They're all incrementing the same atomic. The whatever other line is, the one that goes down, that's no sharing. Each of them has its own atomic and they're incrementing it. And the dashed line, which is there, is ideal sharing. It's just the performance at one thread divided by the number of threads. So basically without sharing, you see that it's embarrassing the parallel programs are embarrassing the parallel. With sharing, it's a weight-free program. Not only it doesn't scale, it actually gets worse with a number of threads. So just because it's weight-free, it works in a fixed number of steps, but not necessarily in fixed amount of time. Time gets longer. Something, somewhere, is waiting for somebody. This is probably like the most you know, theoretical bit of it. Uh, there are two, because uh, just because it helps me to explain some of the other things uh, that I'm talking about later. In these multi-CPU systems, there are two parts where multiple CPUs fighting for the same location have to deal with uh, delays. The first is cache coherency. Each CPU has its own caches. If you are writing into the same memory location, all the caches must be updated. There is a dedicated hardware. There is actually more of that hardware on modern microprocessors than any other hardware that is doing that work. And then when you actually hit the same memory, even though it's log free, there has to be some arbitration. You can't actually write into the same location at the same time, you know, deep inside. It happens one, once at a time, it's just, to you it's at the same time. So how can we figure out what's taking all this time? Well, the there is an interesting thing about caches. While your microprocessor operates on integer words, four bytes, eight bytes, the caches operate on cache lines. And on x86, this is the machine I'm using for testing, they're 64 bytes long. So here is another test. I added the third line, which is what's called false sharing. Each thread has its own atomic variable, but they're sitting right next to each other, so the adjacent ones share the cache line. Now, as you can see for the first eight threads, I'm basically getting exactly the same cost as for the shared variable. So all of the cost of the data sharing of updating the shared variable comes from sharing the cache line. After eight threads, it drops off. Why? Yep, I ran out of cache line. Eight byte word, 64 byte cache line after eight threads. Uh, it got faster because they're now in groups of eight sitting on different cache lines. Exactly right. Now, 
so at the hardware level, there is synchronization, which it's important to understand, you know, shared operation itself doesn't scale. It's not going to scale. Don't, don't bother, don't even try. Its, it's purpose is to use your program to, get to, to enable your program to scale. So you want as, fewer, as few shared variables accessed at the same time as possible because that adds the cost. Now, we have three ways of synchronization, weight-free, not all algorithms can be done weight-free, not all data structures can be done weight-free, log-free, it's maybe very hard, it's usually possible, and locking, well, that's the easiest. It's rare for your entire program to be weight-free or log-free, usually it's per data structure or per algorithm, and that's fine given how hard it is. Okay, well, let's compare these three synchronization mechanisms and we'll choose a very simple computation which actually can be done weight-free, log-free, and log-based, and that's an increment. We have some data structure in the data structure that lives an integer, and we have a pointer to it. And I'm going to increment that integer through this pointer uh, from all threads at the same time. Now, it's not the fastest way to compute the sum, but let's say I need it. Let's say I actually need up-to-date count counter of how many times I increment. So mutex, compare and swap loop, that's log free. And uh, the atomic increment in C++ is spelled fetch and add. Who is surprised by these results? Mutex takes way longer, compare and swap quite a bit faster, and atomic is even faster for basically any number of threads. Anybody surprised? Anybody expected anything different? Anybody thinks there can be something different? No? All right. Nobody has enough imagination to imagine something. Uh, on x86, okay, I, okay I, I'm using relaxed memory order on x86, it's not really relaxed. Uh, but yes, in all, everywhere, I'm, I, I basically nothing, so the reason I'm using relaxed memory order, nothing else depends on that value. The difference between relaxed and let's say release would be if I'm going to read something else indexed by that counter, I want that something else to be ready before I read the counter. Here I'm not, uh, there is no dependency. I'm just reading that counter and nothing else. So yeah, I can use relaxed memory order. Uh, uh, atomic increment on x86 is not exactly relaxed, but never mind that. <clears throat> While all mutexes are locks, not all locks are mutexes. So let me throw in a spin lock that I wrote myself that is lockable. It has the same interface as std mutex. It has exactly the same semantics. If you've taken the lock, nobody else can go through. Any guesses where it fits, where, where the spin lock line would fit on the plot, on the previous plot? Okay, so somebody says it will be better than the lock free. No? Better than lock free. Okay. So, or same as lock free. What about weight free? Better than weight free. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Better than weight free to the gentleman in the, in the aisle. <laughs> Sold. It's a little more complex than that. It's, but yes, for most number of threads, it is. Uh, now, about, yeah. Okay, the question about how I measure overhead is divided by the number of it. The total work, which is, the, I want to increment it, let's, this number, let's say, one million times. So all of the threads together have done one million increments. If the work is evenly divided, you know, two threads have done half a million each, uh, four threads would do quarter of a million each, and so on. That's how it's measured. And this is the total time. So it, it's never, I'm incrementing the same variable. It's never going to scale. 
it's never going to be faster on two threads than on one. At best, it's going to be level. Because I'm just measuring the cost of that synchronization primitive, the, the shared access. Now, after I'm done with my sharing, I'll go and do some work, hopefully, on per thread uh, memory that you know, is not shared, and that's where my scaling comes in. But in order to do that, I have to figure out, okay, this thread works on this element of the array, this thread works on that element of the array, that counter, let's say, index of the array, that's the shared one. So we're all going to increment it, and each thread is going to get its element of the array. Or I'm going to advance the pointer in the list, and each thread is going to work on the node, that, but advancing the pointer, the, the, of the, that's the shared pointer, that's where they get their work from. So I'm just measuring the cost of this one share of this kind of shared variable that controls everything, controls all the access. Okay, well, what does spin lock actually do? Spin lock, okay, please, don't write this in. You saw how great the spin lock was. Please, please, don't actually copy this and write in your code. This is not what's in that spin lock. Please, this is a small portion of what's in that spin lock. This is horrible spin lock, trust me. But the basic idea is there is a flag and we exchange this flag with zero and if what we got back was zero, it means somebody exchanged it with zero before us and we loop on it. That's, that's how they'll work. Uh, now, in this case, we're accessing our shared variable through a pointer, which means we can actually do even a little better. We can grab the pointer itself. This way, if we atomically grab the pointer, nobody can even get to our shared variable through that pointer. We just replaced it with, let's say, null. Mm, marginally better in this case. Now, don't just go and throw out all your log-free code yet. Uh, first of all, there is dependence on the number of threads. As you can see, if you ha have enough threads, uh, log starts to lose. By the way, this is a, well, everything looks good at a small number of threads. So this is a large system. This system has uh, 120 hardware threads, 60, uh, 60 physical cores. Uh, this is a slightly older system. It has a little bit fewer cores. That's not really important, but it's an older, the, the, the first one was an Ivy Bridge version three. This is an older Sandy Bridge uh, system. Uh, Atomic is faster here. Now, I was measuring real time, which is basically throughput. What if I'm in a low power environment, and this is the only slide where I talk about different metrics. I'm not an expert on low power. I, do, I go for maximum performance. But I have to caution you, remember, measurements must be relevant. What if you are interested in power, and a good proxy for power is CPU time consumed? Well, uh, this is a totally different result. This is we're back to the first large system. Uh, okay, what if I'm in a low latency system and what I'm really interested in is lo long tail of latency? Uh, I got those measurements too, again, for this system. This is uh, percentage, so average latency from mutex is, of course, much higher than for log-free, so this is relative to that, to the, whatever your average latency is. This is 90... 90 fifth percentile, uh, so the, only 5% of events take longer than, than that. Uh, <clears throat> so remember, your measurements must be relevant. Whatever you're trying to optimize, that's what you measure. Okay, so mutexes are slow. Locks, not necessarily. Weight-free implementation can be simpler, for, for increment it is. It's usually faster. If you work really hard on your locks, you can get even weight free, give it a run for its money. Compare and swap is actually can be really slow. Although if you have enough threads, eventually lock free start to win. You have to measure enough, maybe more than you ever care about. I have 120 cores on that system. If you don't, you may, you, you may never get to the region where a lot is your threads is your concern.
Okay, let's uh, put it in context of some real data structures. You know, this is just increment, this is a model study. What if it's too simple, oversimplified? Let's put it in some context. We'll have typically your thread safe data structures divide into two fundamental classes. There are node based, uh, like lists and stuff. Uh, they are very good uh, from the you know from the point of like no, not filling them up. There is no fixed chunk of memory, uh, but you're hitting memory allocator pretty heavily, and that may have a lock in it. Uh, then there are block allocated containers, nice cache locality, you have a fixed chunk of memory, you're, everything is running into it, you have to worry about what happens when you run out of fixed chunk of memory. So each has its own problems. Well, simplest nod nodal container, singly linked list in, in C++, uh, <coughs> known as forward list. We have one in STL, has, uh, well, you know the interface that it has, it's not thread safe, it has your normal STL thread safety guarantees, you can't mutate it from two threads at the same time. Let's do the same thing, but thread safe. And I'll start with push front and pop front, insert after and erase after a very similar implementation. Now, forward list does not have a find member function. On the premise that if I know details of its implementation and how it synchronizes its thread safety, I can maybe do better, I will give mine a member function find. Of course, iterators. Okay, push front. Push front is pretty easy. We need a compare and swap loop. We read the head atomically. We prepare a new node. Don't put it into the list yet, but we use the head that we read to set up the next pointer. If head hasn't changed, which means we can basically pretend that no other thread existed for now. We can atomically swap our new head the new, in, uh, in the place of the old head, and we're good. If head has changed, we have to start all over again. Pop front, same thing, same way. Uh, if the head hasn't changed, you delete it. Now, here is the catch. Okay, who here knows what the catch is, why this doesn't work? Hmm? Uh-huh. Okay, uh, well, I, I, I'll, I'll go through it quickly, so don't worry, I'm not going to leave you behind if you don't know. Here is the problem. I'm going to delete T1 on the first thread, the, the first element, which means I took the new, I took the new head, it's going to po point to the element after the one I'm deleting. But this thread is kind of slow. Now, it's not in the good mood today. The second thread comes in, actually deletes T1. It's log free which means you know, I haven't logged the list, deletes T2. Now, I've got a really hard working thread because it also creates a new one. It, it, it does a, a push front and it got back the same memory as was occupied by one of the deleted elements. Now the second thread finally wakes up and does a compare and swap. And guess what, the heads are the same. Compare and swap reports that everything is fine, nothing changed, that says compare and swap. Safely insert a new element into the list, says compare and swap. And this is what you get. You've just disconnected the entire list and your head points into nowhere. Yep, somebody mentioned ABA problem. This is the problem. My head changed from A to B back to A. Why? Because malloc reuses memory. Pointers are not unique identifiers if the memory is reused. What if the memory isn't reused? Well, you'll run out of memory. Furthermore, good memory allocators like to reuse memory because the last memory that you just touched is probably still hot in cache. For very, for much less complex reason, find and pop front are not safe. You have finds running and, I mean, push, yeah, pop front. Pop front just deleted all the elements from underneath your pointers. Uh, <clears throat> so the fundamental problem is that we are deleting nodes to which we are still pointing to. Either find points them or push front, points them or pop front has temporary pointers pointing to them and somebody else is deleting them. There are many solutions to this problem. Hazard pointers is one, but we actually happen to have a very simple one. It's just the thing. We have the shared pointer. 
Shared pointer is designed to solve precisely this problem. It may be. Uh, okay, if I had, let's assume for a moment that I had a shared pointer that is thread safe. Uh, Herb Satter presented this two years ago. Uh, let's look at our push front and pop front now. Same, th same sequence, one uh, thread tries to delete the head element, it gets the old head and the new head that it wants to be the new head. Another thread comes in, deletes the first two elements, we have shared pointers, they're holding the two elements alive, just not in the main list. We create a new element, we can't put it in the memory of T1 because it's not freed yet. It's still in use. Malloc hasn't got it yet. Okay, now compare and swap has to fail. Now the first thread actually notices that compare and swap fails. Let's go of its temporary variables for the old head and new head. That actually deletes the nodes, finally, because there are no more shared pointers pointing to them, and we start all over again. Okay, so that solves the ABA problem, that solves the find problem for the same reason the, the temporary pointers are holding their nodes alive. Uh, in general, if you didn't have just push front and pop front, you would have all of your list pointers to be shared pointers. Other than that, there is no difference. Okay, what can we do about getting that shared pointer, especially uh, since, uh, as somebody said, it's not necessarily log-free? Well, STD shared pointer looks basically like, like that with some more stuff. It has a pointer to the data and pointer to the reference count. It has other stuff that I'm not interested in right now. I can do another one for this specific case. I can have what's called intrusive pointer where the reference count is allocated right next to the data. In my case, I can do it because I control what's the list node. I don't control the T, but I control the list node which has the reference count, the next pointer, whatever else I want to be, so intrusive shared pointer. Can't have weak pointers if you use this design. Now, for all of these reference pointers, the uh, reference count is going to be incremented atomically and log free using just fetch add, so no problem there. Uh, the question is what happens when two threads access the same shared pointer at the same time? Not two shared pointers that point to the same object, that's fine. Reference count is incremented atomically, but the same shared pointer. And why would that happen? Well, because they sit on the node and two threads can be accessing the same node at the same time. Okay, I have several options. In C++11, you cannot say atomic of shared pointer, but you can say atomic load, atomic store, atomic exchange of shared pointer. They're non-member functions. This is in C++11. It works. It doesn't have to be log free, but it is thread safe. Uh, in uh, C++17 uh, TS1, there will be finally an atomic shared pointer. I didn't get that code, I downloaded the code from the proposal that became that atomic shared pointer. So that's what I'm going to measure in this talk. Uh, finally, if, you're, if you abandon the STD shared pointer altogether and go to the intrusive shared pointer, you can actually do something else. You can do the pointer lock that we have already seen, which is basically a spin lock on the pointer. Okay, any guesses about, yeah, well, I'll give you a hint. The next slide will show performance graphs. Any guesses about what we'll see? Well, I don't know if any of them, have, and the, the atomic log doesn't have a mutex. The atomic load may or may not. I don't know how they did it. Um, the spin log uh, doesn't have a mutex, has atomic exchange. Okay, so which one of these three will be fastest? Who says that the spin lock will be the fastest? Who says that atomic shared pointer will be the fastest? You know, it's in C++17, no, almost. On the bottom is that spin lock. The rest, the, okay, that's, now, again, remember, measurements must be relevant. This is me dereferencing the pointer. This is me copying the pointer. This is me doing assignments on two threads simultaneously in an opposite direction, the cross assignment. Which is actually, the, this cross assignment is the whole reason why you need a log free or at least a thread safe shared pointer. The, the rest was, wasn't a problem. It's, you, you can dereference the same shared pointer multiple times 
without any, it's, it's reading it. It's the, the cross assignment where you're making a, you're changing the pointer while you're reading it. That's where you need thread safety. Not looking good for log free right now, I have to tell you that. Okay, the pointer lock is not lock free. Now, the comparison was not entirely fair, I have to confess. Both of those shared putters do more. They have weak, weak pointers, they have other features that my intrusive, shared, my intrusive shared pointer, by an amazing bit of foresight, happens to ideally fit the list and nothing else. So it's not an entirely fair comparison. Extra stuff has overhead. Now, if, I, if all I want is the list, then it's a perfectly fair comparison. All I'm ever going to use it for is whatever I need for the list. I'm not interested in overhead. Uh, list itself is log free, as we have seen. The pointer is not. If you ever get a faster pointer that is log free, you can swap it in. Your other concern is the possibility of a deadlock. Don't worry about deadlock in this case because the lock sits on just the pointer swap. There is no way for you to inject user code into the critical section, which means you can't take another lock while holding that one. Okay, so our atomic forward list we have, will have uh, shared pointers all the way down. Now, uh, one uh, word of note, if you want iterators themselves to be thread safe, meaning two threads can access the same iterator, you need thread safe shared pointers into those, into iterators as well. For this list that I wrote and benchmarked, I say no, iterator has to be held by one thread, so what's inside the iterator is just a plain shared pointer, non-thread safe one. You can put a thread safe shared pointer in there if you want, but just, it will work. Okay, push front, just the push front. Now, how did, I, how did I do the benchmark of just the push front without running out of memory? Well, that 120 core machine also has three terabytes of memory. The benchmark didn't run that long. That's how I did it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, Log-free, so what am I comparing? Standard forward list with mutex, standard forward list with spin log, and my log-free list. Log-free list kind of Man <coughs> managed to beat the mutex, not every time. Push front and pop front, that one actually doesn't run out of memory. Same thing. Again, this is, remember, measurements must be relevant. This is not a fair comparison. If all you want from your list is push front and pop front, this log free list is a massive overkill. Why is it a massive overkill and specifically why where does the extra cost come? Well, it's a massive overkill because it supports all this other, you know, inserts in the middle and all this other stuff, but why does it matter? Spin lock sitting or guarding this entire list has just one shared variable. That's the single point of contention. My lock free shared, li lock free atomic list has shared variables all over the place. There is a reference counter that they're all incrementing and decrementing. There are these pointers inside the shared pointer that I'm spinning on and there is one in every node and one in the iterator uh, and one in the temporary shared pointer. So there is a lot of shared variable access. And that's the price that I don't need to pay if all I want is push front and pop front. But I, I want more than just push front and pop front. Now we're getting somewhere interesting. How would you find with a lock? Well, you could put a lock around the STD forward list and call find that would suddenly make your push front have potentially order and complexity if you happen to be waiting on the find. But it gets worse than that. Find returns you an iterator. You can't delete the node that the iterator is pointing to. You have to hold the lock while that iterator is outstanding out there, which means you can't actually get two iterators because the, the first one locks the list. You could put a lock on every node of the list. You would probably deadlock if you tried that. You would certainly deadlock if it was a bi-directional list. Just traversing it in opposite directions would get you there. Now, I'm not saying that lock, the, the only way to build a thread-safe list is a lock-free list. There are other ways you can use read-write locks. There are other tricks. The point is, it's not as simple as putting spin lock on an STD forward list. And if it's not as simple, lock-free list suddenly becomes a contender. Assuming it performs, does it? Yeah. For find, it does. 
for multiple accessing of iterators pointing to all the different elements of the list, it does, they're all independent. Okay, that's enough for the list. Let's talk about queues. Uh, question? No? Okay. Now, you can do a queue with a list, just push front, pop front, it'll behave like a, like a list. Uh, we'll talk about a different kind. We'll talk about an array, which is used probably as a circular, the ring buffer, array of your elements, and you have some uh, counters that point to the head and the tail of the queue, and you will probably be doing atomic increments on them. There are many, many uh, log-free queue schemas, and they have to do with the fact why there are so many. Well, it's actually very hard to write a gener completely generic log-free queue following this, without the list actually, on, on the block array. And if you do, it's probably not going to be particularly fast. So you take advantage of every practical application-specific restriction that you can get. For example, uh, <clears throat> just before my Anthony was presenting, he mentioned queues that, on which you stop putting new elements after a while. That's actually, that's very, very important for log free queues. You don't have any more producers, so you, you don't worry about discoverability of the new elements. You can just read them all from the head of the queue. One producer thread, multiple consumer head, uh, threads, simplifies your life greatly. Uh, other things like that. So there are a lot of different uh, <coughs> queue strategies. Let's uh, look at several. First of all, let's look at how the queue looks like to producers. Here is our array of elements. Here is our atomic counter N. All the slots up to N are filled. That's no more the producer's concern. What, what does the producer do? Atomically increments uh, N. Now the slot of the, with the old value, with the index of the old value, belongs to that producer thread and nobody else. At least as far as producers are concerned. Consumers are a different story. Producers. So a producer can go and construct the element in that slot at its leisure, and no contention anymore. Other producers keep, keep advancing in. Consumers have to somehow know when producer is done constructing the element in that slot. That's a different story. Okay, let's look at consumer's point of view. Well, first of all, consumers have to know which, what is the next element to dequeue. Again, we have M, which is the front of the queue, Consumers atomical increment M. Now that element belongs to that consumer thread. Nobody else can get to it. Copy it out to the user at your leisure, no problem. Where the problems happen is at the, at the consumer producer boundary. You just atomically incremented M. What if that element isn't there? Could be not there for two reasons. One, it's, it's sort of there, but it hasn't, the producer hasn't finished building it yet. Two, it's actually not there at all. You overshot the, the head overshot the tail. Uh, you have to back off. Consumer has to back decrement the M. Can't just decrement it because another consumer may have incremented. Again, you don't know how much decrement. You can run a compare and swap loop on M to solve this problem. How do you know which elements are ready? You can have a middle atomic counter there, the third one, that tells you the boundary between ready and not ready elements. Incrementing that one is non-trivial because producers can finish building their elements in arbitrary order. So you can't always advance it by one. You can put a flag into the element itself that you initialize last, atomically. And when that is initialized, then the element is ready. Uh, cost you memory, except when it doesn't. For example, queue of pointers. If pointer is null, it's not ready yet. You atomically change it to not null when what it points to is ready, and now it's ready. So as I said, lots and lots of different schemas specific to your unique special cases. Nonetheless, very few, well, not very few, but not too many variants of kind of a normal case. So let's look at some. And how are we going to look at them? What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do something terrible. I'm going to benchmark code that is not correct. I'm going, to profile, I'm going to ask how fast it is before I ask, is it working? Why? Here is why. I have a normal case synchronization protocol. 
whatever that is. I have some shared atomic head, atomic tail, whatever else I have, and I have my synchronization protocol that works in the normal case. The memory is not full, the queue is not empty, consumer and producer aren't running into each other. I want to know how fast that is. That's actually about 10% of your queue code. The rest is handling of all of those special cases. And that's where the bugs will be. Before I go and make those bugs, I want to know if it's worth doing, if it's going to be faster. So I'm going to construct a benchmark that instead of rare cases makes them never cases. I'm going to run a benchmark for just the normal scenario, which is handled by my normal synchronization protocol. And I'm going to measure how fast that is. And then I there is still non-trivial cost to handling all the special cases, or maybe in some cases it's trivial, at least I have to say if not special case. Maybe trivial cost, maybe not. So I have to profile it again. But at least I'll know if I should even try. So here is our simplest log-free queue. One producer thread, one consumer thread. This is actually, this is very simple. This actually pretty, this is pretty much it. There's a very little special case handling you need. Uh, in this case, you actually do the atomic increment, producer does the atomic increment on N, not before, but after it finished constructing the object, because there is only one producer. And at advancing N signals to the consumer that that slot is available. There is again only one consumer, uh, <clears throat> so it, it can do its atomic increment of M after it's finished copying out, and it knows that slot N is ready when you can get to slot N. Circular buffer, of course, the size of power of two, so my module operation is just a bit mask operation. Well, works for one consumer and one producer thread. I'm actually going to run the measurements for multiple threads, which means I'm returning elements that haven't been fully initialized. Why am I doing that? Well, I'm doing that because I want to know if I could somehow, if I was much, more smart, much smarter than I am, and could figure out a way to run multiple threads on that synchronization protocol, would it be worth it? Not so much. So for two threads, it's similar to spin lock queue. It may be a little faster, probably not worth the bother. And I don't know, as I said, how to get it working for multiple threads. Well, I do know how to get uh, for multiple threads a synchronization schema with three shared variables and like, some compare and swap loops running on them. And I did a bunch of tests and the results are more or less the same. I, I'm not going to show you all of them. I'll show just one. Uh, okay, uh, I said I tried Q number two, three, four, so I guess the next one will be five. Uh, okay, this one goes back to atomic head, atomic tail, and a ready atomic ready flag in the node. This solves me the problem of consumers reading nodes before they're ready. So there is a compare and swap uh, loop on the on M. There is just atomic increment on N, and there is atomic atomic rele release store store with a release barrier on the ready flag. So the store was the memory order release. Uh, normal cases, simple, it's non-trivial to deal with, uh, well, depends on what you, what, like, what you want to do when the memory fills up. Do you want to lock and reallocate? Do you want to refuse to enqueue a new element? I'm not worried about any of that right now. I want to see if the normal case works. Now, remember, rule number two of performance, the measurements must be relevant. In my case, the relevant measurement is the throughput of the queue. I'm assuming that elements are flowing through the queue at maximum possible rate. That's what I'm interested. If your queue is almost always empty, the next measurement is going to be totally irrelevant to you. Instead, what you care about is how quickly I can handle the special case of empty uh, queue most of the time. So remember, measurements must be relevant. Your, lo your simulated load for benchmark must uh, be relevant for your actual case. At least for throughput, it's not a competitive queue. Okay. I have, have I convinced you by now that the log-free basically doesn't work? 
Now, this is like the darkest moment in the presentation. Although some people say that things are darkest just before they go pitch black, this is fortunately not quite, not going to be the case. So, the pro so what we have seen is basically compare and swap loop is just killing us. So on the other hand, spin lock is flying, at least for small workloads, if it's guarding small workloads. Wait a minute, small workload. Ah, what if it's not small? I'm going to enqueue a larger object. Takes me some time to actually copy it into the queue now. Mm. Things look very different now. My prototype Q5, again, it's a correct, the prototype is correct for the normal case. It looks pretty good. It's similar to spin lock for small number of threads and it runs way ahead of the spin lock for a <coughs> larger number of threads. So what's going on here? The log based queue is just STDQ with a spin lock wrapped around it. It copies the element under the lock. Lock free queue copies the element outside of, it doesn't have a lock, but it has its equivalent of critical section, the, the, the place where I'm actually touching the shared variable and looping on the compare and swap. I don't have to copy the element again after compare and swap it. Uh, so it, it copies outside of the, of the critical section. That's why it's faster. So multiple threads in the case of lock for q are doing their own copies all at the same time. The thing is, it actually doesn't have to be this way. It's just a natural way to write code in each of the paradigms. So we have to be really careful here. Some of the benefits of lock free are actually not due to lock free itself. It's due to the way you're encouraged or forced to write code when you're doing log free. Of course, now, now that I told you that the next question is, okay, now that I know, now, now that I'm conscious of this, can I borrow these techniques for log-based programming? Sometimes you can. For example, this notion that you want to copy outside of the critical section gives rise to what was popular in around 2008, known as minimally locked queues which probably means they were known in, in 1960s uh, and forgotten after that. Uh, basically, you copy the elements outside of the lock and then you copy the pointers under the lock. Works even better if you don't need to copy the elements outside of the lock because the client's memory for those elements is perfectly fine. Here is another one. Uh, Probably was also known in 1960, but I haven't found the reference. Uh, it's an array of atomic pointers to single threaded queues. You don't lock on the element, you try lock. If you haven't got it, you go to the next one. There is a weirdness about this queue. You give up what's known as sequential consistency. The elements that came in in certain order may come out out of order. That's, uh, sometimes it matters. Sometimes you actually can't tell the difference. Why, why, why can't you tell the difference? Well, two elements on two different threads came off in order, but the return statement on the first thread stalled, so the second one actually finished first. So you may not be able to tell that they came, in, came out in order. Sometimes you can tell, so this, this isn't always equivalent. Sometimes sequential consistency matters. If it doesn't matter, let's see how fast that thing is. This is a trilog based one and you can just have STDQs sitting in that array or you can have ring buffers and the ring buffers are faster. So again, this, this, this is one of the ways to have a smaller critical section. This basically shuffles pointers within critical section. All the copying is done. Uh, advancing the head and the tail is done outside. Now, th this comparison of log-free and log-based performance is very useful in ways of getting understanding that at least to me wasn't immediately clear when I started. There are kind of two sides 
to the overhead of synchronization. On one hand, how long does it take you to figure out whether or not you got access to data? In the case of lock, it's just how long does it take you to either get the lock or fail to get the lock. In the case of lock free, how long does it take you to uh, read however many shared variables you want to read, do your compare and swap, and get back uh, yes or no? If you don't get access, how long do you wait or how much computation do you lose? That's the other side. These two together, that's how much you cost, it costs you to synchronize. They don't necessarily scale the same way. So, in general, for example, for log-based ones, for if you have a very efficient log, it's very cheap to find out if you were granted access or not. It's just one, uh, <coughs> one atomic read or atomic exchange. Then you have to wait for however long it takes somebody else to finish it. Log-free programs, unless they're just as simple as wait-free programs on one or two shared variables, will take longer for you to figure out if you are the one who should, for log free, it's not whether you should get, be getting access, but whether you're the one who gets to commit the results, typically. But it will take you longer to figure out if you got access to the shared data structure, if, you're, if you get to commit your results. But once you do, you, you, you lose less time if you get denied that access. The interplay of these two de determines what's faster. Now, once you understand that, you can actually try to get the best of both worlds. And sometimes you will discover that if you look at your log-based program, it didn't have to be written the way you wrote it. It just was a natural thing. to You put a spin log on a on forward list. Well, with a forward list, you don't have much option. But if you could get inside, if you had your own forward list and could get into it, you could, for example, pull copy outside of the, of the spin log. Some of these natural patterns are there for a reason. They're very hard to avoid. Some are just you know, the paradigm, the way of thinking. Also, again, remember the measurements must be relevant. Which metric are you going after? So I said, how long does it take you to get access and how long do you wait if you don't? That's real time. If you're after CPU time, then the question is how, how much CPU time did it, if you're after power, how, much, how many CPU instructions did it take you to figure out if you got access or got denied? And then, do you idle or do you compute if you are denied? Totally different interplay. Spin lock would, uh, a good spin lock would, would pretty quickly idle you. A mutex would idle you almost right away. Lock, uh, compare and swap loop would keep you computing all the time. So how can you combine the best of both worlds? Well, log-free programming naturally encourages the equivalent of a very short critical, I put it in quotes, there are no critical sections in log-free programming, but the equivalent of it, what you do inside the, the, the loop. Now, log-free log programming also naturally puts your shared variables close to what you're accessing. Instead of having one log guarding the entire forward list, we had our shared variables on every node sitting right there <clears throat> guarding access to that node. If you try to emulate that one with logs, you run a high chance of deadlocking. Well, if you can arrange a, a, a locking schema, then maybe you won't. Now, if you can do a try lock instead of lock, you can do something useful instead of waiting. With lock free, you naturally do that. Finally, I haven't talked about it at all. I don't have time to talk about it. There is a whole other family of log-free algorithms, RCUs and related, which are basically a combination of the two. Uh, you release data by atomically updating a pointer, and it's log-free. So it's like, like a spin lock which you don't spin on. V very few shared variables, very quick access, and it's log-free. Don't have time to talk about those things. The, the challenge there is memory reclamation. If you can solve that, they're incredibly fast. Okay, uh, we're almost on time. Some guidelines. When do you have a chance of succeeding with log-free code? Well, first of all, you have to be sure that your performance is critical. Second, if you have data structures that don't have like a bottleneck for access, like a 
stack, everything is channeled through one fixed point. Guard it with a lock, hard to beat that. Distributed access, last slide. Uh, distributed access, very good chance that you will, uh, lock free will win. Uh, if you have enough threads, you can probably get locks to slow down. Enough could be more than you will ever have or not. Measurements must be relevant. If your lock-free synchronization protocol uses one or two shared variables, and especially if it's weight-free, go for it. It's probably very simple. How, how complex can you get with one or two shared variables and with, with weight-free instructions? It's going to be simple. It's going to be fast. Go for it. If you have to wait, can you do something else useful instead? If you can, maybe it, a totally not, not log based, not log free based, but a try log, which is a kind of log log free uh, approach, will be the, the fastest of the, the third. Will be the fastest of the two. Well, I started with the you know decision diagram for how people really do it. So I have to show you kind of a improved decision diagram, but basically shows what the conclusion slide was. And with one notice, if you're going for log-free code, try to benchmark your prototype, your main primary case synchronization schema. Try to benchmark that as soon as possible. As soon as you can get it to like work more or less correctly, within the benchmark, so you can't handle out of memory case, restrict your benchmark so it doesn't run out of memory, just throttle it. You can't handle empty queue, okay, slow down your consumer so they never drain it fully. And measure the performance of your, ma of your main case synchronization schema. Or maybe if your queue is normally empty, then just measure how long it takes you to figure out that your queue is empty, and so on. But do that as soon as possible. Log free doesn't guarantee the best performance. And writing correct lock-free code is hard. Be sure that you need it. So try to profile it as soon as possible. Oh, after you finish writing it, profile it again. That's all, thank you. I'll take questions. <clears throat> Okay, the question was uh, not just you. I was also shocked when I saw that Atomic, uh, that the, the spin lock was faster than a lock free queue. The question was, is it because in order to support multiple consumers, I had to run a compare and swap loop? Well, as soon as I started to run compare and swap loop, I was like way, way off, you know, basically compare and swap loop doesn't have to apply. <laughs> My weight free program was, depending on the hardware, a little bit faster or I, I've shown you the wait free queue, just the one consumer thread queue. On that, on that piece of hardware that I was using to demonstrate, it was, had the exact same performance as a spin lock queue. On an older piece of hardware, it actually was a little bit better. Probably not enough to justify the effort of actually writing it. By the way, uh, one note, I noticed throughout doing this work is the newer your hardware is, the more likely it is that the spin lock will win. Last time I did this work was three years ago, Nehalem and Westmere cores. Lock free was beating everything by a mile. On the, on, on the latest Ivy Bridge, Ivy Bridge Revision 3, this is what the, most of the results that I've shown you came from there, if I didn't say specially. Spin lock is pretty good. On Haswell, it's better. You don't want to know what happens on Skylake. Uh, not exactly. The Haswell supports, the question is about transactions and uh, Haswell ran up to support transactional memory and then it kind of crashed and burned. It did support lock hardware local legion. Transactional memory is back, by the way, on the latest, on the Broadwell and on Skylake. I haven't tried transactional memory yet. I don't have any hardware that does it yet. I do have hardware that does local legion, hardware local legion, which is X-Acquire and X-Release. Uh, the results I do, are inconclusive at this point. 
so more research is required. You know, I've been in the industry for what, almost 20 years. Since I left academia, I don't think I've ever, ever presented at the conference where I said more research is required. It was the first time for me. When I was in academia, you, I mean, not, to not say more research is required is like saying I don't want the next grant. Uh, but more research is required, yes. Uh, you mean a deadlock avoidance? Huh? You mean the deadlock avoidance? No, like so literally I could take a lock and die. Oh, okay, so like a shared memory lock kind of uh, situation it where... It's a distributed system, basically. Uh, okay, so the question is, uh, there are systems where essentially you have kind of out of process lock, like share, shared memory is an example of distributed system. Basically, the, you, where essentially you can take a lock, the process that took a lock can die, and that doesn't bring down the whole program. Like if, if one thread dumps core, the whole thing dumps core. So not an issue for normal mutex. For shared memory, for example. Now, for log free, first of all, it depends on the synchronization protocol. Sometimes you, you still get stuck. Sometimes you don't. It depends on which synchronization protocols you end up with. Well, you don't get stuck. You lose, I mean, you, you, you lose, you basically, you will, you will never recover access to a portion of your data structure. It depends on the synchronization schema. Uh, th there are, you know, mutexes that have that, like for example, there is shared memory mutex, platform specific. On some platforms there is, on some platforms there isn't. Uh, there are timed mutexes, there are health monitors. So yes, now log-free is in general, becomes a lot easier. You know, it, basically the complexity of log-free versus the complexity of alternative becomes, kind of the gap becomes much less and log-free could become even simpler if the synchronization protocol itself is not tremendously complex. Uh, n but there are log-based alternatives which basically have to do with either with notifications or with monitoring or with weights. These are your three options. Yes. Okay, the question was, uh, what was the NUMA uh, architecture of these systems and would that make a difference? This, the big one had eight NUMA nodes, I believe, either eight or four. I, I, if, if you're interested, I can log in and check, but uh, it had either eight or four NUMA nodes. Uh, I tried some other ones that had only two. Uh, for just hammering on a single shared variable doesn't make, I mean, they all have to get there. Uh, so for that doesn't make a difference. Now, once you get access, the memory that you get to touch now in the privacy of your own thread that was nobody else contends with you, for that it can make difference. I have, I have seen less difference again on the recent systems. Uh, I first again measure it on a Westmere EX, which had eight Newman nodes on with 128 physical cores. It made a lot of, it made like two and a half times difference, worst case to best case. Uh, on these uh, Haswells and Ivy bridges, it, it, you have to be really careful measuring it. I mean, there is some difference, but it's non-trivial to measure. I mean, it's, you know, you have to accumulate enough data basically to get noise low enough before you can see it. So there is difference. Uh, it also depends on your memory uh, allocation and use patterns. So for example, if you allocate memory on one thread and then reflow it to other threads, your memory performance is slightly different than if the thread that allocates it uses it and releases it. Uh, it depends on what your kernel is doing, like if, if your NUM extensions are enabled and if they are, what, what your kernel policy is. Uh, if I've seen both successes and spectacular failures in kernels trying to be helpful. Uh, I've had a Red Hat kernel that was actually decent, it gave me about 20% uh, perform performance bonus when I turned on the NUMA extension. I've had a, a SUSE kernel, they fixed it since then, that 
like did exactly the, like the, the worst possible thing and basically put all the memory in the worst possible location. Uh, so turning on NUMA extension made it about 40% slower. <laughs> uh, so not so much for the synchronization protocol itself, but for the access to the concurrent, to the concurrent data structures, it makes, it makes a difference how much depends on both the hardware and software. Yes. Yes, Michael. Well, by weight free, I mean, do you have to run comparison swap loop or not? If you're not running comparison swap loop, you're going to, you, your odds of actually having superior performance in log free code are dramatically better. Comparison swap loop is expensive. Uh, hazard, Michael mentioned hazard pointers. Hazard pointers are more complex, but far superior performance alternative to that list that I was showing you. Uh, Michael asking me to say the hazard pointers will be presented on Friday. They are harder to get right. It's an alternative way of never deleting nodes that you shouldn't be deleting. It's a higher performing way of doing it. It's more complex. Uh, I haven't benchmarked the hazard pointer implementation uh, for, <clears throat> for this. So I don't know. Now, uh, hazard pointers themselves are weight free. Uh, Well, you know, measurements must be relevant. We have to benchmark on the same hardware <laughs> to actually have uh, correct comparison. S but uh, yeah, if you have some code, I'll be happy to you know benchmark and compare with exact with on the same machine, uh, just to, so we can put it in you know in the hierarchy of <laughs> different numbers. Uh, hazard pointers as a mostly weight-free implementation. Well, there is still a comparison swap loop on the head, but recl me memory reclamation now becomes weight free with hazard pointers are likely to be, well, are known, not likely, known to be much faster. Are they fast enough? We have to measure and see. Any more questions? Oh, yes. Okay, the question was how do you actually uh, prove correctness uh, once you decide that uh, you're done testing broken code and correctness actually starts to matter. Okay, I don't know of a way to like prove, prove it. What I found to be perhaps in terms of like found bugs, well, other than you know the obvious uh, explain your code to, 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 your, to, to somebody else, uh, other than that as far as tooling, uh, TSAN in latest Clang or GCC, the thread sanitizer. So thread sanitizer is basically a race condition detector, but what it does, the interesting thing about it that it is it detects not just the race conditions that happened, but the race conditions that might happen. So if you read and write the same location, so you write first and read later, so nothing bad happened, but you didn't have a memory barrier or a log between them. TSAN will tell you that it's a potential race condition. Even though it didn't actually happen, it tracks it. So in this, in this regard, it's not, it's basically, it's less dependent on luck. You have to actually do read and write. It doesn't analyze the program to figure out that you might do a read. You have to do a read and a write of the same location. But at least you don't have to actually hit the race condition. So uh, latest versions of TSAN understand atomics and memory barriers. And uh, I have actually, you know, I, I have a demo for a different talk uh, where I have a correct program. I go and change memory order release to memory order relaxed and run TSAN and TSAN, ooh. Uh, that still is not going to catch ABAs, yes. So uh, that is going to catch uh, like true, true race condition. You're accessing memory that you are not sure if it's uh, finalized or not. Uh, <clears throat> for ABAs, 
Well, it may, okay, it may or may not catch ABAs. It depends on the synchronization protocol that happened in the way you reclaim the memory. If, for example, if you have a simple free list of your freed blocks and you're pulling them on without additional synchronization, it will catch it just because that block isn't even guaranteed to be there. So it'll catch that. So it depends, uh, but if you hit a full mutex, if you go to malloc and you hit a full, full mutex there, of course the barrier has been acquired after that everything is synchronized. <laughs> Well, if you are not freeing memory at all, you can't have uh, a BA. Okay. So, uh, okay. So that one is actually all right. So, so the question was on a ring buffer, if your if two threads are basically on different generations of rotation, one of them is full rotation ahead of the other, uh, it basically appears to you that the queue is empty, whereas in fact it's full. Essentially, that, that, that's a manifestation of the error. Uh, that specific one I don't know of any way to catch, especially since most implementations of a ring buffer will not loop back. They will let unsigned long run forward all the way out and use the bit mask. So the unsigned longs aren't actually even equal, just the bit mask portion is. You're not going to typically to, you know, you're just going to hit it with atomic increment over and over. You're not going to bring the, the atomic variable down. You're just going to bit mask it. Okay, they're saying me that I have to stop. So that particular one, I don't know of any tool, tool that will tell you. If you have any more, session is over, but I'm telling you, but if you have any more questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer them as long as you have them.